So it's an instinctive response. But if the fly's traveling too fast, it seems like for a steelhead anyways, that it might be too much effort to chase it type of thing. So I like to have a swinging fly, but controlling the speed enough so that it is accessible to the fish. That's kind of how I think in terms of it, you know, just kind of slowly getting away from them. Controlling that speed by making sure you don't have too big of a downstream belly, you know, I think will go a long way towards, um, you know, interesting more fish. That was Rick Kustich on the behavior of steelhead trout. Another chapter from another great steelhead angler today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Find out what's new in the Facebook group by heading over to wetflyswing.com slash Facebook. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. Trestle designs, engineers, and manufactures industry-leading outdoor products and premium apparel. From their patented, game-changing telescopic fly rod carrier and their specialized waterproof cases and fly boxes, to their magnetic nipper system that are revolutionizing how people snip their line. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash trestle to get started today. That's wetflyswing.com slash trestle. T-R-X-S-T-L-E to support this podcast and an amazing product and brand today. Established in 1928, Deddy Flies is the oldest family-run fly shop in the world, now in their 94th year. Deddy's mission has always been to supply the fly fishing community with the finest products and services. Every fly they sell is either tied in-house or by a handful of select domestic tires. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash Deddy to grab your in-house flies today. That's wetflyswing.com slash Deddy, D-E-T-T-E, to support this podcast and the oldest fly shop in the world. Rick Kustich is here to dig back into Steelhead and the Great Lakes. We find out how he came to write his first book on the Great Lakes, how his advanced uh, book came to be, and which word he'd remove from the title uh, if he could change it today, and uh, and what new book he's working on as well. We're digging into all that and a bunch of tips and tricks along the way. Another passionate steelhead angler. Without further ado, here is Rick Kustich. How's it going, Rick? Great, Dave. Great to be on. I listen to your podcast a lot, and um, I'm excited to be here. Amazing. Yeah, I was. this has been kind of a long time coming both ways. I think we've... Uh, your name has come up a lot. We've had, um, I'm trying to think, we've had a bunch of, obviously, a lot of steelhead episodes and a lot of Great Lakes fishermen. And um, trying to think of the last person we had on. I'll, I'll put a link into the show notes to that person. But we've had a ton of people. You're one of the people, probably one of the last people that I've really been wanting to get on. So I'm happy to have you here. No, oh, that's great. So I wanted to start this off. I know you've been on a few different podcasts. I was listening to a little bit of, I think, one from April, and you did a little summer. And, you know, and you've covered a little bit of your background, so I'm not going to go deep into that. But just give us a, a highlight of kind of, you know, how you got into I know you had a fly shop at one point, but talk about how you first got into fly fishing and then take it to where you are today. I started really just with fishing in general. I And I know I have told the story a few times, but uh, grew up on, on an island in the upper Niagara River. And literally surrounded by water and pretty much every wool model in my life was, was a fisherman, um, you know, from my grandfather, brother, cousin, uncle, my dad. Um, and even, even my mom would take me, uh, would take me fishing when other people weren't available. So, um, really it was just in my blood from the beginning. My fly fishing kind of came along when I was about, I believe, um, 11 or 12 years old, just started you know, developing an interest beyond, I, I, you know, I saw it in a few magazines, saw it in a, you know, television show here and there. And, uh, you know, knew that was an area that I wanted to, uh, you know, develop in and, um, just basically was self-taught about the only, you know, going back in those days, this was the, uh, early seventies, there was just, you know, a few magazines and just a couple of books. And, uh, Ended up learning a lot through like the Joe Brooks trout fishing book, um, but self-taught as far as uh, casting and really just anything that had to do with fly fishing. But I was just, yeah, I just remember having such an interest in it and just couldn't get enough. Um, caught my first fish when I was on a fly um, when I was about 12. And um, again, all, all on my own at an old level. 
on an old level line. Um, I was using just, I was rigged up on a spinning rod. I was casting it off a spinning rod, you know, it had self tied some, uh, really crude damsel, uh, nymph imitation. Um, and then it just kind of blossomed from there. Just, uh, insatiable desire to, you know, kind of, um, learn everything I could. And, um, you know, luckily it really, I was in the right place at the right time as the Great Lakes fishery really kind of blossomed as, uh, at the same time when, uh, my interest in, you know, fly fishing was peaking, you know, college after college. Uh, so there was a great intersection there in terms of the opportunity. And, um, you know, I feel like I took, you know, the best advantage of it I could. Nice. I'm curious on a couple of things there on your, um, on your family, as you looked at, it sounds like everybody was into fishing. Did you see, I mean, was anybody into fishing from the, like more of the industry side, you know, like actually as a way of uh, work? No, there really wasn't. It was, it was more recreational, but I'll tell you back in those days, it was still kind of on the cusp of more of a sustenance uh, angle where, you know, where, you know, we fish for walleye, fish for bass, you know, we caught bass back in those days, perch, you know, and, and certainly none of it went to waste, um, you know, and then really was just, you know, something that, you know, we had regular fish fries and things of that nature. So, um, it, it was more from that a- aspect, you know, that it was part of, you know, both recreation and, you know, it was part of, you know, our economy at that point. Right, right. That makes sense. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you're literally, uh, I mean, you're putting food on the table, right? I mean, this is not a, even though, you know, you look at it sometimes now and you're like, well, what does it cost you to go out and go <laughs> steelhead fishing? You know, you add up the licenses and yeah. boats and stuff. You're like, well, we're not actually saving yeah. money. We can probably go buy some, but, but yeah. yeah, back then you, it was a big deal. It was, yeah, it was, it really was. It was part of, you know, like I said, it was part of, you know, the meal planning and part of, you know, the economy at that point. Um, So, you know, nobody was really involved from a professional standpoint, even though, I do, when I was um, probably about eight or nine, I started tying you know, jigs and things like that for our local fishery and sold them to the local fishing club. So that was my first uh, step into kind of the industry at that point. Um, my brother did go on to, you know, my brother's been in the fly fishing business for really, you know, for the last, let me think, almost probably 40 years. So he did go on to uh, work for Winston rods out in, uh, out in Montana and, uh, has been a full-time rod builder ever since and began his own, uh, bamboo rod shop, uh, business about, well, about 15, 20 years ago. Oh, wow. Um, you know, so amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. We were, uh, I was just doing an episode. It's not out yet, but, um, well, I guess it will be when this goes live, but, uh, it was like a classic fly fishing gear with a uh, Ward, Ward Tonsfelt. And, um, mm-hmm. yeah, we were talking about bamboo and it was interesting cause I, I kind of thought, well, classic stuff would cost a lot more, you know, but gosh, you can get a lot of classic gear, including bamboo rods, older rods for a decent price, probably less than you can buy a, a new rod. I didn't realize your brother was, uh, was doing the bamboo stuff. How, how is that looking for him? Is that pretty, uh, pretty successful, pretty cool way to do it? It was. So I mean, he was building uh, bamboo for, for Winston for a number of years. And then, uh, uh, then him and, and Glenn Brackett broke off and began their, you know, their business called Sweetgrass Rods. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and you know, that, uh, certainly was, it probably peaked a few years ago, but they're continuing to, uh, push forward with, uh, you know, a fair amount of, um, demand for their product. So probably as much as they can handle anyways. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I didn't realize sweet glass uh, was uh, yeah. grass was your brother's. That's cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I haven't talked to, obviously talked to Jerry yet, but maybe we'll work on uh, getting him on as well. I, I you know, I kind of, you know, it's obviously tough to connect with everybody, but uh, yeah. um, well, let's dig into a little bit here. I mean, there's a few things we're going to take some tangents along the way, but um, you know, I was hoping to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, you've got the book, you know, advanced um, the Great Lakes fight. What's the title? The exact title on that book? advanced fly fishing for great lakes steelhead yeah exactly and and i know i've heard you uh, that there's been some you know questions on that where people the advance right maybe you would change yeah. the name and take out the advance because people think i mean what, what is the tell us the story of that first of all like is the book for advanced anglers or is it just a kind of a general book what, what would you say to that 
you know, I, I that's probably uh, the one thing that uh, I would have changed is the is the title and <laughs> the one I, I think um, area when I read any reviews, probably about the only negative reviews I ever see on it is just some confusion over the title as to uh, you know who it should apply to. But I guess what I had in mind with with advances. Back in 1999, my brother and I, Jerry and I, uh, released a, a book titled Fly Fishing for Great Lakes Steelhead um, that we co-authored. And I kind of saw this book as, uh, you know, a step past that. It has a lot more um, emphasis on on swinging the fly, a lot much more emphasis on, uh, you know, the spay fishing and, you know, the setup for spay, uh, spay fishing and spay casting. So I guess I saw that as where, in my mind, saw that as the advancement. It's, um, you know, continuing to, the, you know, the fishery, at least in my mind anyway, started out where hardly anybody was fly fishing. And, you know, even some of the, um, uh, you know, some of the gear anglers back in those days would say, well, you can't catch these things on a fly. And then, you know, once you prove that, well, you can't catch them on a, a, a fly that's moving. It has to be dead drifted. And then. You know, you can't catch them on big flies and things of that nature. So, you know, each step of that has been, you know, for me, disproven. It's been part of, you know, my own journey. And, um, you know, so I kind of saw that, you know, the swing and the fly, the spay fishing part of approaching the Great Lakes fishery is kind of, uh, you know, the, the final advancement as far as I'm concerned. So I guess that's kind of where the title comes from, even though it, you know, creates some confusion. No, that, that makes total sense. I think I see that for sure. The, the spay was... Yeah, at one point it wasn't there, and now it's fully there and uh, and thriving. What is, I'm curious, because we had another listener recently uh, reach out, and he said he wanted to hear, I think he said something like, uh, bring out a comparison, you know, Great Lakes steelhead guests versus the uh, West Coast. You know, it's kind of this uh, talk about the differences or flies or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you get those questions about the difference between the two, like for somebody who, say, hasn't either fished the way, I know you fish both if you haven't mm-hmm. fished the West Coast and Great Lakes, what would you tell them? Is there are there a lot of differences these days? I mean, I know there's differences in sizes of rivers, but what would you tell them just generally on that? I think generally the fish react similarly, but it's it, it has a lot to do with the conditions and the environment that impacts the fish's behavior. And I think you know understanding that is really key. But you know, under similar situations and similar. Um, um, conditions, whether you're on the West Coast or or in the Great Lakes, you know I, I find that fish react to a fly in, in a very similar manner. Um, you know the, the grabs, the takes, many of the um, you know the fly patterns I use in the Great Lakes are the same as they are out west. You know I'm using you know on, on larger rivers in the Great Lakes using the same equipment, same tips. Um, but I think just the key is just understanding. Yeah, I, I would say like maybe from uh, a standpoint that you know the smaller rivers in the in the Great Lakes, you know, especially some of the spate rivers, their conditions change a little more rapidly, and you can see dramatic temperature differences, you know, on a, you know from a day to day basis. And you know, and really paying attention is you know to some of those you know those condition changes are are what I think you know maybe impact some perceived different behaviors between you know the West Coast and and uh, Great Lakes fish, but you know, in my mind, it, they're very similar. You know, and and how I approach them is is similarly. Just really kind of keeping an eye on you know how the conditions impact the fish's behavior. Nice. I, I was just thinking, going back on the uh, the book again. You mentioned ninety nine. Uh, was that your first book that that you wrote in the fly fishing space? Uh, actually, that was the third book I did. I started with a book that was called Fly Fishing the Great Lakes Tributaries, which was a self-published book in the early 90s. Uh, I think it was released in 92. That was really one of the first, uh, probably the first book on on the Great Lakes fishery. Um, although I look back on it now and it's pretty crude. And, you know, I really, uh, even, you, you know, my philosophies have changed dramatically since then. Um, but it was, you know, since it was really one of the first books on the market on it, it was a, right. you know, it was a good, good seller for us and, you know, and, and everything. Were you swinging back then? Were you swinging in any two? Just starting to. Yeah. Um, you know, by, by the late eighties and early nineties, I was definitely swinging flies, particularly on, uh, some of the bigger water. 
Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, and it does, you know, that, that book does address that a little bit. I was curious on the, uh, just the swinging again, we've talked, you know, we've had a few episodes on the history, but I'm just trying to connect that, you know, kind of what, to what your history and so when did, so 92, you had that, when did you start? I mean, how did you get into the swinging? Where did that start out? You know, I think influenced a little bit by, you know, some of the, um, just really some of the West coast literature that I was able to, to find back in those days, you know, probably, uh, I'm just starting to even think, you know, Trey Combs, his first book. Um, you know, Lonnie Waller's videos, things of that nature, you know, certainly had a, you know, positive impact on, you know, knowing that that would work, you know, certainly, Mm -hmm. you you know, in the Great Lakes. So I think those things had some influence on it. And then, you know, you just kind of, as with all techniques, you kind of just test them out a little bit and you keep pushing it and keep pushing it. And, um, it was almost immediate for me once I started catching fish, swinging flies, that I would much rather do that than catching them any other way. Even though I knew that, uh, you know, it became obvious that maybe it wasn't, from a number standpoint, wasn't going to be the same, but from an overall experience. And I mean, I think that's always what has driven me from a fly fishing standpoint is a little bit more. I always, I mean, I, I love having success and, um, you know, I, you know, but I do feel like the one thing that has kept me engaged in fly fishing over all these years is, uh, you know, continuing to try to raise the bar a little bit and, mm-hmm. uh, know that, uh, quality over quantity is for at least me is the way to continue to do that. And, um, you know, so I think that was a driving force behind swinging flies for me, even back then. What do you think? I'm curious on the, you know, if you look at, and this is kind of maybe a hard question, but percentages wise, you know, if you had, you're out there right now on the Great Lakes swinging flies with what we're going to talk about today versus nymphing. I mean, if you were to do one a full day and the other, you know, how many more fish would you catch nymphing, do you think? Again, I think it really is driven on conditions. Um, You know, I think when you have good water temperatures and you have, you know, good flows and maybe water with a, you know, a little bit of a stain to it, you know, when, when it's perfect for swinging, you know, I think there's days where, you know, you almost can go head to head with nymphing. There you go. Yeah. But I think where that breaks down, particularly on smaller great lakes, rivers and streams, or when the water gets low and clear, the fish are hunkering down, you know, in the structure along ledges behind rocks and, you know, behind boulders and things like that that's where the nymphing really excels uh, yeah you know under those conditions and you really from a swing standpoint you know in terms again in terms of numbers you know it's it's no way that it's going to compete with uh you know with the dead drift under certain conditions like that but you know once again you, you know I, I try to adapt my swing approach to to meet those conditions you know whether it's going with smaller flies or you know more of a stealthy you know, set up, you know, and things of that nature to try to try to meet those conditions. So in the advanced book, you talk a little bit about everything, right? I mean, you, do you touch on the nymphing as well in that book? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. Um, you know, cause I do think that's as much as that, you know, the swinging is, is the way that I prefer to catch fish. It certainly has to acknowledge that there's, you know, a place and time for other techniques as well. And, you know, in terms of, you know, as people progress into the sport, even to catch your first steelhead or, you know, your first year or two of steelheading, you know, dead drifting patterns is a really good way to get oriented or initiated into steelheading. And especially if you're a trout fisherman and, you know, you're used to dead drifting and things like that, and you're you're making that transition to steelhead, you know, it's no better way to do it probably than that. And then, you know, hopefully within a few years, you will you stick with it and, and, you know, continue to, uh, uh, have a desire to fish for steelhead that eventually you'll look for something more. And, uh, you know, that that's something more for a lot of people is swinging flies. That's right. Nice. Well, let's, um, I wanted to kind of touch on just try to dig into a few things here. If maybe we could focus on some advanced or some different tactics, but just walk through a few of the things in your, in that book that we're talking about here. And I'll put a link in the show notes to that. But, um, you know, I guess we could start, you know, equipment obviously is, is something that, you know, 
we talk a lot about and things like that. But I think it's always interesting, especially with the fly and the swinging, because there's a lot of different lines and there's confusion out there. There can be confusion. If you look at, I think, chapter one, you talk about the equipment and the rig. Uh, what's that look like for you as far as uh, just give us, and I guess we could be talking Great Lakes. Let's just stay on the Great Lakes. Typically, if you're fishing, um, does it vary a lot between the larger, the small rivers, whether you're using a, a longer, uh, how long of a rod you're using the lines and things like that? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think it does. I find that my rod selection has seems to be getting shorter and shorter each year. I just enjoy, uh, you know, I, and I do try to match match the rod to the size of the water. But you know, I'm finding going shorter and shorter, twelve, eleven feet, even especially with, with some of the shorter heads right now, it's, it just seems to connect me more to the river, connect me more to a fish when I have a fish uh, hooked up. And, you know, with the shorter heads, it just kind of makes everything more versatile, um, allows me to fish, you know, smaller waters, tighter areas, things of that nature. So, um, you know, when I, when I can get away with it, I, I really am using rods of, you know, 12 to 11 feet for the most part. But where, where I tend to go longer is on the bigger water and it isn't necessarily for the length of the cast because I still, I feel like I can make, you know, good lengthy casts with 12 to 11 footers, but a lot of it has to do with how deep I'm waiting. Um, you know, I know when, when I'm fishing a handful of the bigger rivers that I fish off, I know I'm going to be waiting deep. Yeah. You struggle a little bit with the shorter rods, you know, if you're doing that all day long. So yeah, you gain a little more leverage with, uh, you know, 13, 13 and a half, even 14 footer, um, that you lose with the shorter rods. And, you know, after, a over the course of a day, I just kind of like having that extra length when I know I'm going to be waiting deep or making real long, you know, where it's required to make really long casts. So I try to keep all the rods in my arsenal, but, um, certainly, uh, use more shorter rods these days, especially on, uh, you know, the Great Lakes waters. Perfect. What, what about a line? What, what does your line setup look like? Are you using the same sort of line most of the time? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, it really varies, again, based on the different types of water. You know, I rely a lot on, on Skagit heads, though, uh, for, you know, just more as an efficient delivery system. You know, when I first started, I kind of had a love-hate with Skagit heads. I mean, I, I understood their you know, their versatility and their effectiveness for delivering tips and heavier flies. But a lot of the, the lines that are on the market just seem so cumbersome to cast, you know, they're clunky. Um, but I, I think, you know, most of the line manufacturers now are, are kind of catching up to that and uh, at least producing Skagit heads that have some feel to them now. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's helped. Uh, so I, you know, I think, with that, I, I end up using more Skagit heads than I probably have in the past. But when I'm fishing up in the water column, you know, lighter flies or I'm trying to go stealthy, you know, I certainly break out a, a Scandi or a, a, you know, Scandi kind of compact Scandies um, as well. So I just I like the feel of those types of lines, too. I, I really I prefer to try to find some balance between enjoying my casting and uh making sure that i can have fishing effectiveness so um you know and then on bigger waters i mean a couple of the bigger rivers that i fish you know i do go to just, i still use uh some mid mid belly lines some 45 to 55 foot lines um you know especially when i can fish up in the water column a little bit so again just trying to match you know match the mm-hmm. tackle to to the situation but a large degree of of skagit lines particularly one fishing down the water column. Gotcha. I'm just curious. And, and is it the uh, Cataraugus river? Is that one near your? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. That's uh, certainly our, one of our main rivers that I fish. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. We had a recent guest on um, that was talking about, he's up in that part of the woods too. Mm-hmm. We were, Oh, we, we did a couple episodes on like the arc flick trout unlimited uh, chapter mm-hmm. and connecting with Michael there and stuff like that. But um, he mentioned that river and how mm-hmm. you know, we talked a little bit about, it, but we didn't have it. Uh, we, he, we didn't go into all the tips and tricks and stuff, but mm-hmm. I'm curious, maybe we can think of that river. Like if you were going mm-hmm. there during the peak of the season, um, or when is the peak? Let's just start there. When, when is the peak of the season on that river? Well, it starts in this year. It was a, was a good example of that when we get some decent water flow, um, you know, by the middle to end of September, there's usually fishable numbers there. Uh, and 
October through November, I would say is, uh, you know, prime time. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it, uh, in New York, we mainly have, uh, you know, winter run fish. So they start, you know, their, their run in the preceding fall. So October, November, um, the characteristic of that river though, that kind of defines it is it's very fickle in terms of water conditions, uh, runs through and a lot of it's just natural, but in the river itself, and then a number of its tributaries, run through you know areas that are just laden with clay banks and um just gets in it and it drains a huge area so when you get a rain uh it has a you know a tendency to 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 rise but also um you know dirty with the sediment that's created by the by the clay and it can take a few days to clear off so uh, you know like unfortunately this year we've had a lot of rain and we just you know, once we got past, um, you know, early October, it's been hard to find consistency in terms of days on the river. Um, so that's, that's the one downside of it. Um, you know, on, on a few years, it'll fish into December and, and then, it, you know, it tends to be a pretty good spring river as well. Um, starting in April and, you know, once, once we have all the snow melt and, um, April, um, and in, even into May. Uh, it can fish for, you know, both fresh fish and fish dropping back down to the lake. But yeah, that's, a, it, it's a beautiful place and, uh, it's a great river for swinging. Um, but it's, it's, it's fickle nature is, is really probably the, the most apparent characteristic of it. Gotcha. Okay. So, so if we look at that river and you're fishing. So I, uh, you know, I guess by the time this publishes the run, the first part of that run will be over, but, um, what would you be using there? What would, be, what would the rod be? Would you be using, using that really short rod on that river? Yeah, I generally use, uh, you know, the 11 footer. Um, I would rig with that and about a, you know, 450 uh, Skagit if I'm fishing down deep and, um, usually a tip, you know, for the most part on that, I would run about a, uh, 10 foot poly leader usually one that's in the six to seven inch per second sink range. Um, you know, an unweighted fly when I can, when I'm fishing nice, even flows, uh, if I'm fishing water that, uh, you know, has a little more surface tension or where I feel like I need to get it down into a slot along a bank or something along that line, you know, I'll also have a fly that has a little weight on it as well, just to kind of cut through and get it down quick. What do you, on those flies, what are you using to add a little bit of weight? Generally, I, I, I fish a lot of tube flies, so I'll just add a cone to the oh, gotcha. front of the front of the tube. Um, a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll just add the cone while I'm on the river, you know, and then just use a use a lighter to to flare up the flare up the plastic to keep it in place. Yeah, the cones. It seems like that's a pretty popular uh, way to do it. Do you find that that's still not the most popular, or why do you think the cones aren't? Um... I mean, it seems like just the perfect way because you can a lot of adjustment and flexibility. What's your take on those? Is, is it is it the most popular thing now out there? I think it's a very you know sensible uh, you know versatile <laughs> way to approach it. I'd say more more anglers are tying on uh, on shanks though, even in the Great Lakes, than they are on tubes. Um, I like the simplicity of a tube, but I I do feel as though uh, you know even just tying on a shank and I you know my fishing partner Nick Pianessa you know full time tire. Um, he, and I, and I agree with this. I mean, he tends to, uh, like the shanks just because it adds just that little bit of extra weight, um, a little less surface tension. You know, that's the one downside of the tubes is, you know, they add that surface area there and they don't sink quite as quickly. So even an unweighted, um, an unweighted shank is going to get you deeper than a, you know, unweighted tube. Um, you know, so there, there is an advantage to that. And I, and I do see where a lot of guys, you know, tie on the on shanks so uh just to me the tubes are just one step simpler you know especially when i'm trying to tie a lot of flies and i've had good success on them too so you know i've had good success on tubes and now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors with more than 40 years of experience in coffee the anglers coffee team roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind delivering excellent coffee to every single angler Responsibly sourced from farms using sustainable growing practices, you can rest easy knowing you are doing your part. Roasted and shipped within 48 hours to assure freshness. For me, it's all about that freshness and taste. When I crack open a bag of Anglers in the morning, I feel good because I know it not only tastes amazing, 
but I'm supporting great movements along the way. With a coffee blend for every taste, a dry dropper on the go tea bag option, and a roast sampler, you know Joe at Anglers is serving your needs. It's time to step up to better coffee and more impact for the fish species and causes that we love. Just visit wetflyswing.com slash anglers to grab your bag of greatness today. That's wetflyswing.com slash anglers, A-N-G-L-E-R-S, to make a change and get a sweet taste today. Okay, now back to the show. What about, I know, let's see, I guess this is, I think, chapter two of your advanced book uh, talks about, like, casting. You know, obviously that's another huge struggle for a lot of people because it's the casting can be, like, a lifelong journey. Uh, maybe start there just for the curious on you. How long did it take you to get the spay cast dialed in, and, and do you feel like um, that's still the biggest struggle for most steelheaders transitioning? Yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of from my own casting, I mean, I think it's a continuous, you know, I, I feel my, my feeling on casting is it's something you can learn in a few hours and spend the rest of your life trying to master, um, you know, and I still feel like I'm in that, you know, it's somewhere in that process. Um, you know, I'm always, you know, trying to get better and uh, trying to learn some new things. And, you know, I think even from the standpoint that, you know, it's like any you know, finely tuned sport. If you're not doing it all the time, your timing gets off. So, I mean, even if I notice a difference if I, you know, I haven't cast in a, in a week or two, you know, it takes me a little time to get my timing back. So, uh, you know, I think it's just something that you, you just have to, you know, kind of keep at and, and, and practice and, and get good technique. But yeah, I think casting has become a bit easier with the shorter had lines. I mean, I think, you know, schedule lines have made, you know, the, the, you know, I, I guess it, you know, shortened the learning curve a bit. So, um, you know, I do think that, uh, it has provided the opportunity for more anglers to become proficient in a shorter period of time. Um, so I do think though that, uh, it is still somewhat of a deterrent, uh, to at least people making that step from, uh, you know, single-handed use to uh, two-hand use, but I do feel as though, um, you know, I, th- I think it is more inviting than it probably ever has been in the past in terms of being able to do that. It, you know, I think the one thing that possibly turns people off, I shouldn't even turn them off, but confuses people even more is just the rigging. Um, it, you know, and I've even seen it this year with, uh, you know, guiding and, uh, um, you know, a class that we had earlier, it's just, you know, the, the you know, skagits and scandies and, you know, loops and tips and leaders. And, you know, that seems to be more of a, a point where people struggle than even the casting itself. Um, and I, you know, I just feel as though that, that part of it, that, that confusion, um, you know, maybe keeps people away from, you know, getting into the, the, the two handed space. Um, even more than the casting. Yeah, we make it more confusing probably than it has to be because I think it's, uh, yeah, I think back to the the episode quite a while back, Marty Sh- uh, Shepard had on, uh, we, he talked about, you know, just getting into it. We were talking about like West Coast Steelhead, but yeah, I mean, it's pretty much just go grab a Skagit line. Like you said, go grab a Skagit line, grab a couple tips and, uh, you know, get out there and do it. I mean, it, but it's more specialized, like you said, depending on water conditions, things like that. Um, but really, you know, to be honest with you, it's always been, you look at single hand, I mean, back before the spay thing was the game, you know, it was still, you, you were still chopping up sinking lines on your single handed mm-hmm. rod and still ma- you know what I mean? It was still just as mm-hmm. confusing probably back then. What's going to get the newbie, like the new person to this, you know, how's it going to be easier for them to get into it? Or, or is it pretty easy, right? You know, right now, you know, I think just, continued education. I mean, and there is good education out there. I mean, you know, there are some really good shops that, uh, you know, can guide individuals. There, um, you know, some of the spade claves that are around help individuals. I mean, there's a lot of good YouTube videos and things of that nature. So I, I do think, you know, that the, the key is just, you know, finding one of those resources that, uh, has, you know, the ability to kind of really sort it out for you. Um, I actually am working on a book right now that uh, is is hopefully going mm-hmm. to help that process. 
um, out quite a bit. But I can tell you, even when I'm writing, it's interesting to try to put things into the right buckets to kind of help, you know, explain the process on a, on a simple basis. I mean, to me, it is fairly simple, but um, like I said, you know, some of the experiences I've had this fall really indicates that, uh, you know, it has to be explained in a manner that makes people feel comfortable and, um, you know, feel like they're progressing, yeah. you know, in, in terms of their knowledge level and, and understanding of it, um, you know, in, in, a, in as you know, clear terms as possible. Right. How would you explain that? It just, I mean, I, it sounds like you're right in the middle of working on it with the new book. So if you had somebody that was, you know, who had never picked up a spade rod before, um, and you were going to be coaching them, what would you tell them? You know, I think, you know, first trying to identify, you know, what you want to do with it is the key thing, you know, what kind of water you're going to be fishing for, what's your, your quarry. So, I mean, I think that's really always going to be a starting point, you know, just even in terms of like we talked about, you know, the rod length and, and size and things of that nature. So just picking out the tackle, but I, you know, I, I tend to agree, you know, what you were saying with Marty before, I mean, you know, just trying to keep it simple and, and not get too complicated, you know, get yourself a, you know, a, yeah, first of all, kind of understanding the importance of lining up a head with the rod that you choose. Uh, I think that's, um, you know, even just the, the most important starting point because, you know, we, you have yeah, seen it you know, over the years. We talked about, you know, rigging for, you know, you mentioned it with single hand rods. You know, a rod can feel so different with the wrong line versus the right line. And, um, you know, I think that even gets exaggerated even more with a, uh, two handed rod, you know, you want to make sure that it's the, you know, that it's rigged properly, even though a lot of rods today can handle a pretty wide range of grain weights. Um, you know, just finding the right head and the, you know, the right line for that rod, I think is an important starting point too. Cause I, you know, too often I have seen where, and whether it be guiding or at a spade clave where someone's trying to, to, um, make a cast, but they're, they're casting with a rod that's just, you know, totally imbalanced in terms of the line that's on there. And so I think, you know, I think getting just that starting point, you know, of understanding what you're fishing for and then getting a line. And it can just be as simple as just starting with the Skagit because that's going to be the easiest to cast with at the beginning, but making sure that Skagit is the right, you know, the right size, from both in terms of length and um but a grain weight for that rod that's right and maybe the better thing to do or the, one of the things to do is yeah like just like we all you know always say going to the, your local fly shop and if you can get a lesson and get hooked up that'll probably save you you know a year or so of of probably wasted time right learning for your i mean you learned a lot of us learn by ourselves but do, do you recommend um do you have a local fly shop near your area now so um we don't uh you know and you had mentioned it earlier we that the only real shop that uh is in town here is a or orbis store so I, there is a local shop but it's not a locally owned shop um it's an orbis corporate store um you know, we owned a shop for a number of years i think of as long as 20 years but it, it uh, i did sell that and then it did close down about um three or four years ago unfortunately so, uh, but there are a few other good shops and, you know, in the Great Lakes area that do cater to, um, you know, do cater and, uh, you know, promote swing fishing and two handed fishing. So, um, you know, lining up with, with a couple of those is probably the best way to go. And there's uh, you know, good instructors pretty much in every state, you know, across the Great Lakes now, good guides, instructors, but I, I agree a hundred percent, you know, spending a day or two with a knowledgeable individual, um, is, is probably going to be one of the best ways to really shortcut your learning curve. Do you, uh, you know, that, that shop, uh, what was the name of the old shop, the shop you had that you own? Oak Orchard. Oak Orchard. Oak Orchard. Yeah. Yeah. Started it up on the Oak Orchard Creek, uh, back in the early nineties, early to mid nineties and brought it into the Buffalo area. Um, sometime, uh, maybe three, four years after that. Uh, and that's where it existed for, you know, the time until it, it closed. Gotcha. Do you miss the, uh, having the fly shop, all that looking back on it? There's things I miss about it. There's definitely things I regret that, uh, you know, I, I certainly would like to still be in that business. 
it was just kind of a, a life thing at that time. Um, you know, some changes in my life, uh, you know, uh, you know, a divorce and, uh, just some things were changing rapidly that it just it seemed like the right time to, to make a move. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a lot of times where I think back of that, I wish I wouldn't have been so hasty and, uh, kind of kept at it. So I would, you know, it'd be something that I wish I had now, uh, to be honest with you, but, but a little too late in my life to restart anything. So. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it seems like, yeah, the fly shop thing, you know, there's obviously lots of great fly shops and it's uh, not easy. And I, I know myself, mm-hmm. you know, my dad had a, a little shop back in the day. And, you know, I remember mm-hmm. it was kind of one of those things where I remember my, I don't know who it was, my mom or somebody, they were talking about back when, when I was a little kid and they were talking about this old guy who used to have the old fly shop be- when my dad was young <laughs> and talking about how rough of a life not, well, not rough life, but it was more like, um, you know, it wasn't like he wasn't making billions on the fly shop or whatever. And it was a struggle. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking like, wow, okay, that is a struggle. I wonder what it would be like for my, for my, for my dad. And, you know, to be honest yeah. with you, it was a struggle, right? It was a struggle at times. And, yeah. and then, and so I don't know, I, I think it depends on who you are. I think like all this stuff, man, if you love it, if you're passionate about it, you can make anything work. Yeah. Yeah. It was a struggle in ways back then, you know, and, you know, and in, in the early or late nineties, early two thousands, you know, there wasn't, there was a, there was a fair amount of competition with sh- small shops, but there was also, it, you know, it didn't seem like there was the, uh, big box influence at that time. And, you know, it was, it was, I thought, a, you know, a good time to own a shop and, you know, we had some, you know, some very good years and, um, you know, I had, but also had a lot of trials and tribulations. It was just a, you know, it was a, it was a lifestyle. It was a good time back at that time too. I had a lot of good friends that were associated with the shop, a lot of good people that, uh, you know, that either worked for us or with us and things like that. So it, it just was a great, great community of people that supported it. And I really miss that part of it too. You know, I miss, uh, you know, just, you know, I still have a lot of those relationships and a lot of those friends, but it's, you know, it's different than it was back then. And, you know, I, I really, I really cherish that. And, uh, when I look back at it, I, you know, it was a, really, it was a great time. Yeah. It's a good, get that perspective on it. I was curious, you mentioned the spade clay. Are there, is there a spade clay up in your neck of woods? Uh, there is one on the Salmon River, which is uh, about two and a half hours uh, east uh, of where, you know, I am in Western New York near the Buffalo area. Um, it's called Spay Nation. And it had, I'm not sure where it stands now. I mean, COVID kind of, there was going to be one year where they were going to take a year off. And I think that was going to start again. And then I think COVID got in the way. So I'm not sure what it, it typically occurs in June. I'm not sure what the plan is for the future with that. I do feel, I do think though, it's going to be uh, back in place at some point in the future. I'm not, I'm just not sure you know, what the plans are there. But it's been a really good, successful um, spay gathering for sure. Yeah, nice. Well, on that note, I, you know, and going back to just looking, thinking of your book again. So casting, you know, that that is a struggle. What, what would be a tip? Would you have? I'm not sure. We were kind of on this line of trying to think of advanced tips, but what comes to mind when you you know you you, you hear the casting struggle, right? What, what do you tell somebody, you know, if they're if they're having a hard time getting the fly out there? Yeah, I think you know, to me the spay cast is a series of steps and um you know each each step has to be you know completed in order to you know complete an entire cast so that's kind of how i learned about learned about the cast it's kind of how i still think about it it's kind of how i try to teach it still um but being able to make the forward or switch cast you know, just where you're not changing directions, just keeping it all in one plane, you know, is the, is the essential building block of every spay cast. So to me, getting to that point, um, is, is really needs to be the first step in terms of getting your timing down, being able to, you know, understand an anchor point, understand a D loop and, um, being able to come complete cast every time. So to me, you know, that's the starting point. And, you know, you can do that. You don't have to do that on, on moving water. You can do that on, uh, on a pond or, you know, any, anywhere that, uh, where there's some water to create some tension, but just making that forward cast and just being able to, you know, always stick your land, your anchor point, being able to get some nice energy in the D loop 
and um it, it, you know and, and get your bottom hand you know engaged i think it, if somebody is going from single hand casting to two hand casting the biggest hurdle is to understand that it's truly two hand casting and that um you know your your upper hand and you know generally it's going to be the dominant hand for somebody that's uh moving the two-handed casting is now more of a guide as it is the power and your power really needs to come from the bottom hand and really understanding you know to have a heavy bottom hand pulling that bottom hand in to really get that fulcrum um i think is is one of the you know the key steps uh so really just you know practicing that in getting the getting the the timing and the form down in that forward spay and really understanding that, you know, that using that bottom hand, I think is as a step that everybody needs to go through if they're going to be effective casting, you know, being able to make all the casts. How do you know when you're using that bottom hand correctly, or is it just, you could see it in your cast? Yeah, I think both. I mean, I, the, the best, I guess, tool to the best gauge of that is where that hand's ending up when your forward stroke is complete you know it really should be pulling right into your body so you know it should be out when your when your d loop is formed you know pushed out away from the body and then it should be you know it's kind of smacking up into the body when you're completing your forward stroke um you know or or, you know especially you know and and then and sometimes your your hands will be positioned a little bit higher so that you know it'll be coming more into your arm but either way it should be coming into your body uh at some point at at the end of the stroke so i think that's really the gauge and you should just feel that you know you should feel that there's more pull than there is push yeah exactly do you uh so in your books or in this the, the advanced book or this new book you're working on do you try to how do you explain the casting in the book is it like a step-by-step photos or how do you do that? Yeah, it's just, it's a step, definitely step-by-step, you know, with the photos in there. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, in my mind, it, it does a, a good job explaining the cast. I think the casts are complicated enough and everybody kind of learns on their, at their own way. So I do think that, you know, pictures help some people. Um, I do think, you know, videos help other people. Um, you know, hands-on instruction is best is better for other people. So, you know, I think, I think the book does a good job at explaining the casting on a, you know, from using pictures and text. Um, but I'm not sure that's always the best learning tool for every individual. Yeah. I I was just trying to think of a couple of resources. I, I, uh, episode 233, we had Ed Jaworoski on and he, he's Mm -hmm. got the book on perfecting the cast. And I think, Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, he he talks about it. How yeah, it's 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 all you know together. I'll put a link to that because I I don't want to uh, butcher the description, but that was a good episode that talked a little mm-hmm. more just about casting in general. Um, so okay, cool. Well, we're kind of working through. I'm just kind of thinking of a good you know way to work through. And I obviously we're looking kind of thinking about your advanced book. Is the new book you're working on now? Tell us again. Is there a title and and what? How is this different from the the current uh, advanced book or your old advanced book? Yeah, so really, it's it doesn't have a an exact title yet. We're still so I, I'm about ninety percent through the writing portion of it, but it is going to focus on just spay in general and kind of the state of modern spay fishing, and uh, have a heavy emphasis on both rigging, equipment, casting, but. Um, yeah, you know, certainly are more of an emphasis on the fishing part of it as well. And really all, all aspects of two handed casting and, um, you know, where it can be applied, um, even kind of blurring the line of, uh, of really what spay fishing is, you know, traditionally been anyways. Nice. Yeah. So you're, this is a good evolution. I mean, you, so like you said, back in 92, you've got the, the, for the first book, which is just kind of great lakes. And then, uh, then you you write the advanced book, which is kind of everything advanced. And now you're taking it the next step further, going into just spay. Um, what's going to be the next book after that? So after you get the spay book, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I I think I'm going to take a break after this one. You know, the the books start out. I always uh, you know I have some great enthusiasm for them at the beginning, and you know, and then in the middle part, things just really start cranking out. You know, I I I give my outline and. 
you know, but the ideas kind of just keep flowing. And, you know, there's a lot of times where I can't write them down as fast as they're coming into my head. And that just seems like you get to the last 10% of the book and it's just, just such a grind. And that's where I'm in right now. <laughs> so uh, thinking about another book at this point is, uh, it, it's tough, but you know, give me another two or three years and then, you know, I'll probably be ready for another one at some point. I would like to do a trout book at some point. I mean, you know, I have spent a lot, you know, a lot of time just fishing for trout in different ways, you know, and whether it's, I, I really love dry fly fishing, I like streamer fishing and things of that nature. And it's really been, you know, the one consistency in my fly fishing over the years is, you know, I always spend a certain amount of fishing days fishing for trout and it's where I started and it's where my roots are. So I would like to do some kind of treatment on that at some point. There you go. And you also have uh, a musky book, right? Yes. Yeah. That's my most recent book. That was, uh, um, let's see, that was 2017. I believe that was released. So I get, kind of had a fairly light, you know, fairly lifelong connection and passion to muskie, you know, growing up on, on, on the Niagara river, there's been a musky population there, you know, ever since I was a kid and, um, you know, kind of somewhere in the oh, late eighties, early nineties, my, the interest in, you know, the fishing, the river and, and musky fishing kind of connected with my interest in fly fishing. So been fly fishing for musky ever since, um, you know, the early nineties, that's been quite a journey. It's back in those days, there was nobody doing it, um, to a point now where it has become fairly popular and, uh, you know, which is great. I, you know, there's really some solid populations of muskies now, you know, fishable populations of muskies in, you know, numerous states and provinces and, uh, um, you know, a lot of fly anglers now with, with the equipment that's available today are really taking advantage of it. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, there's a lot of people probably listening right now that are interested obviously in steelhead, but you know, what would you tell them if they, you know, hadn't fished for muskie yet? Is it, um, you know, I mean, it's similar in, in, in some ways, right, to steelhead, but is it, what would be the pitch to, that, say, somebody would want to go for muskie? Because it's kind of challenging, right? It is. It is a challenge. Uh, the, you know, the muskie has earned its reputation as the cast of 10,000, or the fish of 10,000 casts for a reason. <laughs> Sometimes it. So the fish of 10,000, <laughs> and the steelhead is a fish of 1,000 casts, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you're adding another 9,000 casts. Right. That's probably about right. That's what it seems like, too. To be honest with you, um, at times uh, they can be. They're you know muskies that they're they're top of the food chain predator anywhere they exist, um, and you know and they act that way. They act with a certain swagger, and uh, um, it's they're intelligent fish, and they're difficult to fool at times. Um, and you know they they usually are quite careful about what they eat, and you know getting finding a fish that's in the, in the right mode and you know, presenting your fly in a way that triggers it to take is, is the challenge in that, in that sport. And, um, I would say it is, you know, trying to get some, it just, it's a very exciting experience. It's one that, yeah, there are some similarities between musky and steelhead in the, you know, I'd say in the covering the water and the persistence that it takes, um, you know, that, you know, it could happen on any cast, but it probably isn't going to happen on any particular cast. Uh, and really just kind of understanding the quarry, understanding water, you know, why a fish is in a particular place versus where it's, you know, where you wouldn't expect them. Um, you know, that's all part of, uh, all part of it. And certainly understanding that you're going to be making a lot of casts, you're going to be out there, but I'll tell you when you, when you hook one of these fish, uh, especially a bigger one, even to this day, um, after fishing for them for 30 years, I mean, your knees are knocking and it is probably, you know, some of the most exciting experience you'll have in fly fishing. And, um, you know, and it's not just about the catching, it's really about the whole approach, but when you do hook one and, it, and it's interesting because, you know, even a, a fight with a big muskie does, doesn't generally last real long. I mean, people will see a picture of a big muskie that you caught and say, geez, that must've taken you you know, half hour to reel that fish in. And, you know, and the reality of it is, is you landed it in two or three minutes, um, by putting, you know, you know, the right amount of pressure on them and everything. But I'll always say with how much effort it takes to hook that fish in the first place, um, that's 
the most exciting two or three minutes of all fly fishing as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, when you get one on and you know, your buddy's there with the net and, and, and you know, and you're, you, you want to enjoy the flight, you want to enjoy the experience, but you also want to, you know, complete that task and get that fish in the net. It's just, you know, when you, when you finally do it, you know, especially when it's a big fish, I mean, it's this moment of elation, but it's just also this moment of relief that, you know, you're able to kind of pull it all off and, and put it together but it is just really is the most exciting experience um you know in, in fly fishing as far as i'm concerned so that would be the sell it that would be the selling point <laughs> that's pretty good that's pretty good selling point. how does it compare to you know like just the take you know you got the steelhead take that whole process up to the take versus the musky process up to the take in terms of the actual take of the fish yeah, like if you're swinging flies for steelhead versus yeah. the the musky, uh, you know, I know you're sometimes are chasing it all the way in. So that's is it is it better than a steelhead take? I think a lot of times it, it's different. Um, although there can be some similarities. I mean, I you know that that heavy grab of a steelhead is really that that second one you realize there's a steelhead coming tight to your swinging fly is yeah that that's that is an instant that that really is um, you know that excitement that that i think characterizes you know swinging a fly for steelhead versus muskies i mean the the grabs are so i mean you know steelhead grabs can be different too i mean sometimes they're real energetic and pull line and other times they just you feel the weight of the fish but musky takes really run the gambit in terms of what you might experience i mean you may you may have a fish that kind of just climbs onto that fly and then next time you strip it you know it's kind of there just with weight you know and and there's other times where you'll actually feel like the tick of a fly and it just feels like it just kind of something just grabbed at it but a lot of times that's the fish eating the entire fly and coming at you a little bit and so in those situations you don't feel anything but you know with experience you realize that that was probably a fish that grabbed your fly and you need to strip like hell to try to get tight and, you know, and be able to set the hook. Um, you know, a lot of other, you know, um, takes with muskie and, and, and again, another selling point of, of, uh, muskie fishing is a lot of hookups occur right next to the boat and they're visible and you see them happen. Muskies have, you know, out of their curiosity, have this ability to, or, you know, have this drive to, to follow, you know, and whether it's fly fishing or gear fishing, you know, to, to follow the, the lure, the fly right back to the boat. And, um, you know, why they do this, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, are they looking for the, the you know, are they just being curious? Are they looking for, you know, some vulnerability in the prey? Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's a little of all that. You know, they can follow it because they, they can, you know, they're on top of the food chain. They don't have to worry about anybody messing with them. So, um, you know, you get a lot of fish that, that follow that fly right next to the boat. You know, sometimes they'll grab the fly as it's coming into view. Most of the times to get them to eat at the boat, you need to, you know, change the direction of the fly. You know, so you go into what, you know, we refer to as a figure eight or, you know, do ovals with the fly. You want to strip that fly down so that it's only about 12 to 18 inches away from the tip of the rod so that you can move that fly, Yeah, you know, in a, in a way that... um you know, entices the fish to, to grab. And usually it's, you know, like I said, using, you know, big turns in a figure eight or just big turns in an oval so that fish can follow the fly. And a lot of times they'll grab it as it's going into a turn because, it, you know, it shows the fish, you know, shows the muskie, the, the fly at a, uh, um, at a, you know, perpendicular angle. So better attack angle. And, um, you know, and, and a lot of times just speeding up the fly, you know, at the, at the, at the boat. Um, you know, entices, you know, makes it look like the, the fish is, you know, the bait is finally trying to get away from them, you know, and that'll entice them to take. So in those situations, it's, you know, it's, it's a much more visible situation. And again, from a selling point, and if that doesn't get your, uh, if that doesn't get you going, seeing a, you know, 40, 45 inch fly or fish, 45 inch fish chasing your fly, right, right next to the boat, you know, then you should probably give up fishing in general at that point. <laughs> Yeah, that's intense. That's intense. How, and out of that, how many times when you're doing that, um, you know, what percentage of those fish are actually taking the fly when you, you know, if you said overall in general in a, in a year? Well, I, you know, I think it, you know, depends on, you know, where you're fishing and whatnot, but I, I, I feel like, 
I don't know if I can get, you know, one, I'll just say one third of those fish to eat. You know, I think that's probably doing pretty good. I mean, there's days, you know, there's, there's strings where you'll, you might get, you know, half of those fish to eat and then there's strings where you, you know, where it's less, but yeah, I think if you can get one out of every three to, to eat the fly, you're doing pretty well. And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors, including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. To be honest, I have never been a huge net guy, mainly because I didn't feel like my uh, old collapsible net was easiest to use and was not easy on the eye, if you know what I mean. The Stonefly uh, net not only looks beautiful, but has high quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that's second to none and can be customized for a little extra touch. For Ethan, the founder of Stonefly Nets, fly fishing has always had a traditional feel going back to fishing the three-weight bamboo rod with his great-grandmother. When Ethan designs a custom net, it's his hope that others will create amazing lasting memories for years to come. Please head over to wetflyswing.com stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y to get started right now. Okay, now back to the show. Let's go back. I, I want to keep on this, uh, just back to your advanced book. And uh, techniques was, I think, chapter three. Uh, you know, you got into dead drifting and swinging. And, and I was actually just out testing out some strike indicators. I think these were the New Zealand strike indicators. It was like a yarn thing. Just And mm-hmm. they were actually really sweet. I never used yarn indicators when I... I've done a lot of indicator fishing mm-hmm. for steelhead too, but... Um, but the yarn is cool. So we're, I guess we won't dig into that, um, today, but as far as the talk about swinging, if we stick on that, what's a, you know, if you think beginner tips versus advanced tips, what is a beginner? If somebody's wondering about swinging flies, what, what do you tell a beginner? And then what do you tell somebody that's more advanced? Um, you know, beginners, I would say to, you know, have some understanding of, of the water, um, that you're fishing. And, you know, and where you would expect to, you know, find steelhead positioned in that water that you're fishing. Um, What I would also say, though, is, you know, and again, I can see this by watching other other anglers understand what, you you know, and this this could go for beginners or, you know, even more advanced, but understand what your fly is doing, you know, kind of be the fly, Uh, you know, really make sure that you're making a cast that straightens out, um, you know, that's fishing right away. You know, if you're, if you got big curves or you're piling up your, uh, your tip or your leader, um, you know, that fly isn't fishing right away. So, you know, I, I always say, you know, make the cast repeatable cast that you're comfortable with. So again, if you're a beginner caster and, you know, you can continually make 40, 50 foot casts, and, and make those 80, 90% of the time. And this goes for musky fishing too. make that cast and don't try to keep pushing it longer and have a 50% effective cast. So make sure you get that fly. So that's, that's number one, get that fly so that it's turning over well, straight and fishing right away. But from there, just understand how that fly is presenting itself in the water and making sure that from what you can see that you feel that fly is swimming either, you know, perpendicular to the current or swinging across the current and showing itself in a way that a fish would want to eat it. You know, I think too, too often I just see anglers just flopping it out there and thinking, well, I'm swinging, you know, it's out there and without really recognizing that, well, maybe their, you know, their fly is actually going downstream for a while or it's whipping through there too fast. Um, so just, I think that's, that's the thing that I would say, you know, understand the water and then understand what your fly is doing for, for beginners, um, for more advanced anglers. Um, it's just kind of an extension of that, but 
understand really what you're trying to do with the fly, uh, you know, and, and make sure that it's, you know, the speed and the depth is where you want it to be for the situation that that's, that you're trying to, you know, address. And I guess what I mean by that is, um, you know, when the water temperatures are in the fifties or forties, you know, the fisher tend to be a little more aggressive. Um, you can get away with a fly that's maybe swinging a little bit faster. But one thing about steelhead, at least in my, my estimation is they want to chase the fly. You know, it's an instinctive reaction to, to, you know, to, to chasing. Um, I'm sure it's either left over from when they were, you know, when they were in the, in the stream or river, same thing out in the lake when they're, when they're chasing, um, when they're chasing bait. So it's an instinctive response, but if it, if the fly's traveling too fast, it seems like for a steelhead anyways, that it might be too much effort to chase it type of thing. So I like the, I like, I have a swinging fly, but controlling the speed enough though, that it is accessible to the fish. That's kind of how I think in terms of it, you know, just kind of slowly getting away from them. So too fast of a swing, a lot of times I think is, is not, is not good. So, you know, controlling, controlling that speed by making sure you don't have too big of a downstream belly, you know, I think will go a long way towards, um, you know, interesting more fish. But at, at the same time, when the water temperatures are cold, I really want to slow that swing down, you know, and, uh, you know, eliminating the downstream belly, maybe even, uh, um, pointing the rod tip more across river. So you're not getting as much of a belly so showing the fly a little more, you know, the butt of the fly to the fish as it's kind of working across in a more of a slow manner. Um, but the same thing with depth, uh, you know, understanding, understanding your depth, either with, you know, controlling your sink tip, controlling the angle of the fly, controlling the, um, um, you know, the weight on the fly. I, I, Again, when the water's colder or when it's off color, I do want to fish that fly down in the water column, but I don't want it so deep that it's just scraping the bottom the entire time. You know, I do feel like I want it in that bottom zone, that bottom one third of the, uh, of the, um, of the pool, but making sure that you're not fishing too deep and, uh, not scraping the bottom. So understanding both speed and depth control, I think are, you know, the keys for more advanced fishing. Knowing what the fly is doing, you know, is, is definitely a good, I mean, how do you know, you know, if you're thinking about it, how are you thinking about that? How do you know what the fly is doing if it's below the surface and you can't really see it? You know, some of it is I can tell depth, you know, by, if I feel the bottom. Um, so that, I mean, that's the one thing. And again, I don't want to feel a lot about them. I don't really don't want to feel it much at all. Maybe just a tick at the beginning and in letting it swing. Um, I prefer to try to just, just get the sense that I have the right depth without ever hitting the bottom. Cause I just want to, I just want it riding a little bit higher up. I just feel as though if it's hitting the bottom it might even be too low. Um, you know, and, and I think that almost works against you. So, uh, but that, but that's one, one area where you can, you know, kind of test it a little bit. Like, uh, am I getting down deep enough? Maybe I'll angle up just a little bit higher. Or I'll make a little more of a mend. If I feel one little tick, then I know, okay, well, I must be there. So I can just angle down a little bit more. And, uh, you know, so that's one way to test it. But in terms of, I think there's just a certain amount of experience that's required to really get an understanding of, of what your fly is doing. But I think the key is just kind of watching where your line, if your, if your line is, pointed in a certain direction, you know, you got a tight tip and a tight leader by extension, you can kind of, you know, get an idea of where your fly is and what it's doing, you know, what angle it's at, you know, and how fast it's moving. Um, but I do think it's, you know, it's a, it's a thing by just being observant of, of your line and, and your tip for what you can see. And, uh, and, you know, and, and just kind of extrapolating that into, into the water, but that's really the, you know, the big key. And I just, like I said, I think that's, if there's one thing that I think differentiates a a successful person, a successful angler at swinging a fly from one that isn't, is really just making sure that you understand what your fly is doing at all times. That's uh, no, that's killer tip, and yeah, especially like you said for a beginner, that's you, you know if you get out there and you first just kind of swing and trying to get your cast right and stuff like that, and then yeah, and trying to think about what the fly is doing is almost secondary. But that that is a great point. 
Uh, mm-hmm. You in staying on the track um, in your advanced book, I think chapter four talked about strategy, behavior, and water. And you talked a little bit about there just water and the fly. What's the behavior? Can you talk a little bit about that? Is that are you talking um, digging into a little bit on fish behavior? What what would be a let's go back to that same thing, kind of a beginner tip and a advanced tip for on the behavior category. Yeah, I just think that's everything that you know, understanding how the various conditions impact the fish. Um, you know, from water flow to water temperature to water clarity. Um, you know, each of those has a you know, a tendency, I mean, there, there's obviously in all fishing, hunting, there's no hard and fast rules, but there's tendencies and, um, you know, understanding water flow, you know, when you, when you get a lot, you know, there are a lot of spate nature rivers in the Great Lakes. And when you get rain or runoff and it brings up the flow, um, it usually stirs the pot, usually a good thing for, for steelhead fishing. And, you know, just like it is out west as well. But, you know, on, on some larger rivers, it might not be as pronounced as it is on, on smaller rivers in the Great Lakes. Um, so understanding, you know, that that represents an opportunity, you know, and I, and I think more and more anglers, you know, as they become savvy, you know, clearly understand that. I can s- certainly see that that's no secret any longer, you know, just judging by the number of anglers, <laughs> on our, you know, on some of our rivers, you know, as, as they're starting to clear up, people understand that. But but it is still a key a key component of this, you know, that, that, um, you know, water flow brings, brings fish in, um, understanding water temperature might even be more important, um, particularly the swings in water temperature. Again, as we go to some of our spate, you know, spate rivers, you know, it's not uncommon if you get a cold snap or a cold night for water temperatures to drop 10, 12 degrees. You know, I've seen dramatic drops. I've seen them, I think as large as 16 degrees overnight. Uh, that has a, huge impact on a, you know, fish's attitude and fish's activity. Um, you know, and so understanding how, you know, if you, if you're swinging flies one day and then you go back after such a cold front has come through the next day, those fish, they're going to have a totally different attitude. You might find them in different water. They might be located more in softer, quiet water. They're not going to chase as much. Um, so really understanding how you might, you know, make adjustments to your swing. A lot of times in those situations too, if I'm fishing on my own, you know, I won't go out first thing in the morning. I'll wait till the afternoon until, you know, water temperatures have uh, at least recovered a bit anyways. Um, kind of put that, uh, you know, to your advantage that way. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, water clarity, you know, how that impacts, you know, you know, I guess from that standpoint, it really, I think in terms of the clarity being something that impacts my fly selection. Um, you know, I use larger, darker flies in, in dirtier water, um, using smaller, you know, more natural colors, olives and browns and things like that, uh, when the water, when the water drops and starts to clear. So just thinking about how those different conditions impact a fish and then how that should in turn impact how you approach the fishing. What's the, if you go to a clear, you know, super clear condition, super spooky, or wow, well, just, just super clear, how small flies are you, are you, do you go down, what do you use? And what are you typically using for your flies? What, what's your style? So you're still using two flies, just small, small two flies? Uh, yeah, I think when, when I go to, um, when you get in a little smaller flies, sometimes I'll be tying on those on hooks. So uh, sometimes I just, you know, to try to just keep them more subtle looking and, uh, you know, allow them to sink a little bit more. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go, I'll start going away from the tubes on the real small patterns. Um, I just like little buggy patterns. I mean, even, you know, honestly, just some small woolly buggers and things like that, you know, I think are, are good small woolly buggers, small wet flies, um, you know, are a good match for when that water gets really low and clear. Uh, and that's the one time where, you know, I feel, for the most part, I'm not too worried about leader and tippet size um, when I'm swinging flies. Um, you know, I, I my feeling is I always want to have a heavy enough tippet to withstand, you know, the grab of and the grab and turn of any big fish. I mean, I think it's uh, you know a mistake to break off any fish when you're swinging. I don't just don't think there's you know there's any the need to go any lower than then then you need to because the fish is reacting to the fly and, and and seeing it from the side or behind 
Um, but I do say when the water gets low and clear, you know, there is a, a, an element of stealth, especially if you continue to swing in those conditions that, that can go a long way. Um, and, you know, a lot of times I'll go to, you know, one of my more effective approaches for low clear water is to go to like a Scandi line uh, or other, the you know, other, uh, and, and just a long, um, monofilament and then to a, uh, fluorocarbon tip leader, uh, and then just a weighted fly, you know, some type of a weighted, you know, bugger or, you know, bunny bugger or something along that line. But uh, even though a weighted woolly bugger, uh, is a really good approach for when, uh, you know, things get really low and clear and it just adds an element of stealth. Yeah. That's cool. And, and on those leaders, when you're low and clear, is that just a typical, you're just using a pretty long leader or what, what do you got going there? Yeah, it's usually about the length of the rod. So it's, you know, and that allows you to, you know, cast pretty uh, easily with the, with the Scandi line. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Well, this is good. And we're touching on the fly, I guess, just on that flies, you mentioned flies. That was, I think chapter five in the advanced book. What's, um, you know, do you have a go-to wet fly that you're putting on either in, out there in the Cataraugus or if you're out west? Yeah, my go-to uh, is pretty much the same, you know, in BC as it is in uh, in the Great Lakes. And just I just like a marabou tube. I mean, real simple. You know, usually two colors, you know, black over purple, black over blue are two of my favorite color combinations. Um, I tie that in a reverse tie manner. So that, uh, you know, it stays puffed up, gives it some silhouette in, in, in the water and, and a lot of movement, uh, usually add some flash to it as well. Uh, just to try to, you know, put that element in there. I think it does attract fish, you know, when that, when that flies swinging and, and it hits different light, um, you know, I think that adds a, a realistic element to it. But to me, that's, that's my go-to fly. You know, it's just that, uh, just very simple. It's simple to tie. Um, you know, I seem like I get really good hookups with, with the, uh, with the tube and having that, uh, hook right at the very rear of the materials. Um, I also like some bunny flies. You know, there's one that I've always used called a bunny spay that, um, you know, I, that I kind of came up with a number of years back, I used to tie it on a, on a hook. I tie those on tubes now as well. And, um, yeah, and, and those are wide, wide, wide variety of colors, black, purple, white, you know, olive. So those are my go-tos, but, um, you know, and then, and then I have some other more traditionally traditional looking wet flies that I'll use at times as well. But it's, you know, it's kind of, kind of hard to beat, uh, you know, those flies that have been working for, for so many years. Exactly. Well, and as we kind of wrap this thing up here, uh, Rick, we got, uh, so the, I guess the final chapter six in that advanced book, you talked about just different rivers and streams. And we mentioned the, the Cataraugus at the start, uh, if we stay on that, assuming you cover that, what, what streams do you cover for in the book? Do you cover like one stream for each state or do you cover a bunch of different streams? It covers a, uh, various rivers and streams on the, on each state. And I think it focuses on some of the more prominent and popular fisheries. I shouldn't even say popular, but more prominent fisheries, um, has an element in there of really more the where to is a lot about the character and characteristics of that river, you know, versus, you know, where to start and things of that nature. Um, you know, there's an emphasis in there on, uh, identifying the rivers that have natural reproduction, um, you know, and, in in those rivers that kind of create a, uh, or, or, you know, provide for a quality experience, um, either whether, because of their size or because of, uh, you know, the, the scenery involved or again, wild fish or, you know, level the run and things of that nature. So try to incorporate, uh, you know, all of those types of factors in there. Um, and, you know, I feel as though if you can have that kind of starting information, um, it's easy enough to, to, to Google where to, to actually get started on a river anymore. So, um, you know, I think more of the characteristics, uh, you know, of that, of that river is probably more important in terms of somebody finding the type of experience they're looking for. Uh, what, what's the, I mean, I guess before we leave this, I'm just thinking characteristics. If you're going to a river you're not totally familiar with and you're trying to, you know, again, read water, find fish, you know, what, what is there a kind of a, 
yeah, be, beginner or advanced tip on that for somebody? How, how do they, you know, starting off new, how, how do you find those fish if you don't know where they're at and you can't see anything? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for me, you know, just trying to, you know, read water on the, from the surface anyways. I mean, you know, going to a new spot generally, you know, I, I always have a inclination to walk away from the main access points so to me the first thing to do is to <laughs> never fish at the pool right near yeah. the parking lot you know unless maybe there's absolutely nobody in it but uh you know so that that's always my first thing is you know think in terms of okay here's the access point um i'm gonna at least walk this far down type of thing but i you know i'm just trying to visualize you know the type of water that has you know a depth of two to three feet um at least you know at a minimum and and has uh you know, a current that's probably in that two to three, you know, miles per hour, you know, the same, mm -hmm. same pace as my walking pace. I think that's always a, you know, good starting point, trying to recognize some water that has, uh, you know, at least some element of, of structure. So trying to identify some, uh, you know, some elements on the surface that would look like there's boulders or drop offs or, or ledges or something along that line, you know, and that's always a good starting point for me. Yeah, perfect. Well, I guess, um, you know, we're going to take this out of here. And, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit out. I, I don't think we're going to go into the 222 here. Other, other than I'm just curious on resources uh, as you write, you know, another book on it. This is going to be another cool resource. Uh, but what else is out there for folks? I always love to hear that, you know, maybe somebody, you know, that's not the stuff you've written. Where, where do you direct them if they're coming to the Great Lakes? They Maybe they want to get some, you know, some advanced techniques or beginner. Is there a, a, some other good stuff out there? Well, I think in, in terms of, two-handed fishing you know i learned quite a bit from simon gosser's spay casting book i mean i still think that's a you know i think that's still a really good uh source you know in terms of you know i talked about you know in my book that you know has step-by-step -step in pictures he has step-by-step -step photos and a lot more in depth so i i do think that's a really good resource i know that's something that i learned a lot from um so I think that's a, that's a good resource. There are, like I said, a handful of other, uh, you know, shops in the Great Lakes that are, you know, promote, promoting swinging flies and spay casting and, you know, a number of good instructors. I mean, if you go to pretty much any of the, the major rivers, river systems in the Great Lakes, there's guides and instructors now that are, you know, top notch, you know, so that's come a long way in the last, um, you know, 10, 15 years in the Great Lakes. So there's you know, a lot of, a lot of great guys that, uh, great guys and women that are, you know, willing to, you know, to share their knowledge and their passion. Nice. And, uh, the salmon river. So that's one up there. Is that the busiest river in the, in the country? Uh, you always hear these stories about how you shoulder to shoulder and all that stuff. Are there any others that are busy like that? It, it's certainly, if it, if it isn't the busiest, it's certainly got to be in the top five. Um, but you know, that being said, it's still a, it's a beautiful place. And, um, you know, the, the, the worst pressure occurs when the Chinook salmon are in and, you know, you get to this time of year when, when it's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty hardy environment up there in terms of weather and cold. Um, and you get to this time of year and you really can find a, a quality experience up on that river and those fish, even in, you know, water temperatures that are in the thirties, when the, when there's fresh fish coming in, they can be pretty aggressive and they still, they'll still charge a, a swung fly pretty well. So there's, you know, in my mind, there's ways to get around the pressure on every river. Um, you know, you just have to think about them. Sometimes it's, you know, you know, taking advantage of shoulder periods, inclement, uh, weather, um, uh, you know, hiking, you know, floating things of that nature. But, you know, no matter how, how busy, I mean, all our rivers are getting busy. It's, it's really, if I, if I had to, you know, point to one thing, the biggest difference in the last 20 years, it's, you know, how much more crowded the rivers are nowadays, you know, the, the available information has, has made it so that, uh, anglers are much more efficient now, um, in terms of being on the water on the, on the good days. But, uh, you know, I still believe that there's there's ways to to beat that as well, and the Salmon River is you know one of those a really a really good spay fishing river for sure. That's cool. All right, Rick. Well, I'll let you get out of here. I guess the next um, year, I guess your book is that the biggest thing coming up for you. 
Uh, or anything else you want to give a yes. shout out? That, yeah. That, when's that going to be published? Any idea? I'm going to say probably about a year from now. Okay. I think that's about the process usually takes. So, um, but I'm not, I'm not sure. But I, I would say with, with about a year from now, I would expect to see it. Yeah. If I can get it all finished up. <laughs> Perfect. So in, between now and, and the end of the book, is it pretty much just we're working on getting the, the book ready or do you have any other big things going on out there? You know, the, the one thing that I really want to start doing in the next, you know, next year is more video type of, um, presentations and, you know, really, really just doing more YouTube type stuff and, uh, really working in that area. So I'd like to, what I'd really like to do is, and again, I, the idea of doing it and getting it all done is, but, you know, kind of takes, take my last couple of books and break down some of those items in there and, uh, you know, just do short little video clips on and, uh, you know, you know, take a section and just try to do it more in a, um, a, you know, video format. So that's, that's one thing I'm going to try to work on over the, over the next year or two. That's a great idea. Yeah. I think, I think that'll be awesome. Yeah. YouTube is just going to keep, keep growing. And uh, yeah, I mean, the more you talk mm-hmm. about, it, I was thinking, uh, Cheech from fly fish food was on and he made the note. Um, I was asking him about writing books. So it's interesting cause you're writing the book here, but mm-hmm. I asked him if he's going to be writing any books anytime soon. He's like, no, he's like, I don't think so because the YouTube videos they do can just connect with so many more people. You know, the fact that instantly yeah. it would take him, you know, a year or whatever to do the book, but he can publish, you know, uh, how many videos in the year and it'll connect with thousands of mm-hmm. people. So I think it's smart to get in, to YouTube. The challenge is obviously YouTube is not easy to do well. That's the, that's the struggle. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, man, if you, if you do it well, I'm looking forward to that. I'll, I'll definitely be watching some of those videos for sure. Because the book is, some people are, you know, some people are audio, some people are video, some people love reading. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you can present mm-hmm. it to everybody, that's a good thing. Cool. Well, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what, that's kind of my feeling. And, and like you said, you, you hit it, you hit it right on. You got to do it well. I mean, you know, it, you can go out and do it. And if it looks like, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're producing it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, just it just it just has yeah. to look good. It has to represent, you know, a certain level of quality, and that's where I need to work on right now. Yeah, that's it. Awesome. All right, Rick. Well, we'll send everybody to I guess just uh, rickcustage uh, dot right? Yeah, that sounds good, Dave. Yep, I can. Uh, you you can send me messages there. You can kind of see what else I'm up to, and uh, you know, go from there. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks for taking the time today. This has been awesome to dig into it. I, I think it's always, you know, you always think, you know, how do you do another Steelhead episode? But I, I feel like you know, I could I could probably do all Steelhead episodes. But uh, do you feel like we, we got some, um, I mean, I guess we touched on a lot. Do you feel like we we missed a few things? Where would you send people if they were, if we didn't touch on everything today what, what, to your stuff? Do you think just hit, grab that advanced book or is anything else? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that goes into all the in depth i mean i feel like there's everything you need in uh, the advanced book to take advantage of the great lakes fishery for sure okay and uh, yes specific questions people can reach out to me perfect all right we'll, we'll uh, catch up with you soon and uh, we'll go from there okay great dave it was great talking with you and um we'll be in touch so there you go if you want to find all the show notes all the links and everything else we covered today head over to wetflyswing.com 277 that's 277 Reminder, uh, if you want to ask a question for an upcoming guest, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash Facebook and uh, and just leave a quick note right there uh, and you can ask a question. That's all I have for you today. I want to thank you for stopping by to hang out and uh, hope you enjoyed the show and hope you connect with me online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.